You see it for the first time when you round a corner on a remote road in the Sierras. And there it is. It looks like a Gothic building dumped randomly in modern California. Everything about the state is new. The houses, the roads, the cars. Yet here is something from another time. You find out it is the Alta Hydroelectric Powerhouse, one of the oldest in the state, and one of the first of its kind in the world. Since 1902, it has been generating power in the same building, using much of the original equipment. The key piece of equipment is something called a Pelton wheel. Every powerhouse has something like it to convert the force of falling water into rotary motion. Its invention was key to the process, and it was invented nearly 150 years ago, just a few miles from this spot, by Lester Pelton, a mining camp tinkerer. His wheel is still in use today. The early California hydroelectric powerhouses lit the cities and powered the factories of a growing state in a story we still find amazing today. 117 years ago, it was of immense importance. The citizens of Sacramento, California cordially invite you to join them in the Grand Electrical Carnival commemorative of the successful installation by the Sacramento Electric Power and Light Company of the greatest operative electrical plant on the American continent, Monday, September 9th, 1895. B.U. Steinman, Mayor. Who was Lester Pelton, and what did he invent? Water wheels have been around since the beginning of civilization. For 2,000 years, they've been called upon to provide rotating power for low-speed applications, like the Bale Grist Mill in Napa Valley that mills wheat into flour. The wooden water wheels of the day were slow, ponderous, and creaking giants. Their design virtually unchanged for centuries. They couldn't spin a wheel fast enough to generate electricity. The gold miners in the Sierra Nevada needed high-speed rotating power for machinery, for water pumps to drain mine shafts, and for air pumps for ventilation. In the 1870s, they needed electrical power as well. On the positive side, the miners had almost unlimited supplies of water cascading down from the Sierra Peaks, which they used for high-pressure hydraulic mining. Inventors scrambled to develop a small, high-speed metal water wheel to harness the high-pressure water. Lester Pelton lived in Camptonville, a small mining community where he had immigrated from Vermilion, Ohio in 1850, one of thousands seeking their fortune in the California gold fields. He was a carpenter, a tinker, and a tinsmith, multi-skilled, like many of the miners, who had to develop their own solutions, thousands of miles from home. Competing with other inventors, his invention succeeded first. It was simple. He put dividers in the water cups at the perimeter of the wheel. This focused the energy of the water while it diverted the flow of spent water away from the wheel. These two effects increased the efficiency of the wheel from the 60% that was normal for the time to 70 or 80%, enough to spin a wheel with great force and at great speed, fast enough to generate electricity. His wheel was also adaptable. It could power massive air pumps, or like this one, about 12 inches in diameter, it could be hooked up to a water hose to power a washing machine. Pelton perfected his design at the Miner's Foundry in Nevada City, patented it, and went into business as a Pelton Water Wheel Company in San Francisco. Within a few years, his machine was in use throughout the country. But like most of the 49ers, there is little written about Pelton. The few sources that exist tell us that he was a mason and that his remains were eventually returned to Vermilion. It appears that the man was lost to history. Thank mm -hmm. you.
The west coast of America had been charted for some time, but the interior was largely unexplored in the early 19th century, as John Reed's 1795 map shows. By 1843, John C. Fremont and other explorers had traversed the Great Basin to the Pacific coast, but their maps still omitted vast sections of the inland west. What was clear, even from the crudest maps, was that a large mountain range lay only 100 miles inland from the population centers on the coast. Steep canyons were cut into the mountains from their crest to the great inland valley to the west, and at the bottom of those canyons flowed swift-running rivers filled with cataracts and rapids. In 1853, Secretary of War Jefferson Davis dispatched a military expedition to survey the newly acquired California Territory. The expedition's leader, Lieutenant R.S. Williamson, engaged the services of a New York geologist, William Blake, who was taken by the majestic appearance of the mountains and wrote in their final report to Congress. The snow-covered peaks and ridges form a long line, which although distant stand out in full view and glitter in the sun's rays, or become tinted with red and purple at sunset. Extensive groves of beautiful oaks cover parts of the surface so as to form natural parks. William P. Blake, July 13, 1853. The explorers recognized the rivers they encountered in the Sacramento Valley of California owed their flow to the annual weather pattern. The rivers flowed from melting snow, which was captured in snowpacks of 20 and 30 feet. This lofty chain of snow peaks rises like a wall between the Pacific and the interior, and acts the part of a desiccator to the moist winds that pour in from the ocean, abstracting the vapor that they hold and condensing it upon the summits and fields of snow. California's climate is Mediterranean. The summers are dry and the precipitation comes in the winter, raining at low elevations and snowing in the mountains. In the spring, snow melts the rivers. By midsummer, the melt-off is over and the rivers and creeks retreat to trickles of water and wildflowers populate the Sierra Nevada meadows. Gold seekers found quantities of gold in those mountain canyons that were unprecedented in history. The water made it possible to extract the gold, but it had another use that would outlast the gold rush. It created a hydroelectric potential unmatched in North America. Water conveyance systems, a catch-all phrase for ditches, canals, flumes, and pipelines, were the first step in the development of water in California. When were they built? You could say they were there from the beginning. The first day a miner pushed his shovel into the ground to find gold-bearing dirt, he also pushed his shovel in the ground to dig a ditch for water to wash the gold out. Miners needed water for their sluice boxes and long toms, and water companies were organized for the purpose building small diversion dams to funnel water into ditches that were ubiquitous in the gold country. The early development of water companies was attested to by Blake's expedition when it visited the gold fields of Placer County. The aqueduct of the Union Water Company is constructed along this valley, and we caught occasional glimpses of the flume stretching across the ravine, and high in the air amongst the topmost branches of the trees and oaks. These flumes are of sufficient capacity to carry the water of a good-sized mill stream. It is expected that the extension will provide a most abundant supply of water. While the downstream flow might have been of interest to the farmers on the valley floors, the miners in the mountains saw only one use for the water, besides drinking, washing the gold out of the dirt. Water was sold several times over. It was used by several parties in succession until, from the quantity of fine slime in suspension, it became as thick as pudding and would no longer run. The miners worked out a concise measurement system for the use of the water. Instead of gallons or acre feet, they measured water in what came to be known as miners' inches. It was an unusual method, but it seemed to work for everybody. Coins were scarce in California, so miners paid for the water with French francs, Mexican reals, or the most abundant currency, gold dust, poured from leather pouches and measured by the ounce. The 1853 expedition commented on the widespread use of hydraulic mining, which required large amounts of water, delivered at high pressure, which was blasted at hillsides by aptly named monitors. 
The hydraulic miners turned to the owners of water conveyance systems, the ditch owners, for their supply of high-pressure water. When hydraulic mining was outlawed in the 1880s for its destructive effect on the environment, the high-pressure feeds would be repurposed to generate electricity. Blake also noted the water conveyances were maintained by men with the colorful title of ditch tender. It was their job to rake leaves from the canal, plug leaks, and keep the water running without interruption. In this image, the ditch tender lives in a cabin straddling the water. Conflicts arose around the use and ownership of the water. Miners, farmers, loggers, and eventually hydro operators all clamored for their portion of the stream flow. Usually the total flow was oversubscribed, meaning that more water had been sold to various users than could be supplied by the watershed. Charles M. Coleman writes about what could happen when there wasn't enough water to go around. The farmers fought constantly for what they considered their rights to the waters of streams used for the generation of electricity. Power company employee G.R. Milford came close to death several times as a member of the company's staff. Milford was threatened by Molly Flood, a ranch woman, who attempted to split his head open with an axe when he stopped her from diverting water, which was the property of his company. From this arose the water suits which occupied the courts of Shasta County from 1912 to 1920. PG&E ended the fighting and litigation when it purchased all conflicting rights. Mrs. Flood used the money she received in settlement of her claims to purchase PG&E stock. Three of her four sons and a son-in-law became employees of the company. Milford became general manager of all Northern California. Whether large or small, old or new, every hydroelectric plant is composed of a few simple elements. A water conveyance system, a forebay, a penstock, a power plant, and an afterbay. The water conveyance system delivers water from an upstream source. It may snake its way around dozens of miles of ridgelines before it reaches a height above the canyon floor to allow for a drop of several hundred feet. Usually there is a forebay, a small reservoir filled by the canal, which stores water to maintain a constant feed into the pinstock. The pinstock is a visual feature one associates with powerhouses, long pipes that drop down canyon walls. For each foot that water falls, it develops about a half a pound of pressure. Inside the powerhouse, the water is directed from the pinstock into an aiming nozzle, which concentrates the flow into a stream only a few inches in diameter and focuses it on the cups of the water wheel. The wheel spins with great power under the force of the stream. Its axle is coupled to a generator. Within the generator, an armature with copper windings moves within a magnetic field created by a permanent or electric magnet. Electrical power is drawn from the armature. The power runs to a transformer, usually outside the powerhouse, where it is increased in voltage so it can be transported long distances on electrical pole lines. The spent water flows into an afterbay, where it accumulates to be fed into another water conveyance system and used to generate additional power at stations downstream. Taken together, the building of the plants may represent the largest civil engineering projects in California after the Transcontinental Railroad was completed in 1876 and until the interstate freeway system was built nearly a century later. Unlike the railroad construction, which occurred mainly on mountain passes that were heavily traveled, the powerhouses were constructed in remote canyons that were out of sight of the general public and were largely overlooked at the time. Historic photographs of the construction shows us the challenges they faced. Transportation was the first. Roads were non-existent to most of the sites. Workers used steam engines, Model T trucks, or pack mules, whatever did the job, to haul massive generators up and down the canyons. Materials were equally challenging. In designing the penstocks, for instance, engineers were dealing with water pressures at the bottom of the penstock of thousands of pounds per square inch in a pipe several feet in diameter, forces larger than they had ever encountered. Hundreds of workers settled into camp life at the construction sites. Kitchens, stables, doctor's offices, 
and even hospitals were documented by PG&E photographers for investment bankers in New York who purchased the company's construction bonds. The camps were huge and required tons of supplies. Hydrographer Tony Roscoe details the quantities needed for just one powerhouse. Some of what it took to build Pit 1. Over 12,000 tons of steel, 58,000 cubic yards of concrete, 10,000 feet of tunnel excavated, 401,776 cubic yards of material excavated for that tunnel, 4.3 tons of copper cable used, 105,000 pounds of blasting powder. Powering 857 men for over two years took 206 tons of meat, 39,000 dozen eggs, 35 tons of bacon and ham, 20 tons of butter, 9 tons of lard, 159 tons of potatoes, 121 tons of flour. A single image captures the scale of the projects. In 1912, at the Spalding site, a construction superintendent rides his horse before an assemblage of several hundred workers and livestock. He looks, for all the world, like a Civil War general reviewing his troops. Considering the timeline, that might almost be possible. Many of the historic powerhouses are contained in beautifully designed buildings that survive to this day and can be viewed by the public. My name is Terry Lopez and you're here at the Folsom Powerhouse State Historic Park in Folsom, California. The Folsom Powerhouse sent electricity down July 13, 1895 and continued sending power to Sacramento until 1952. After that, it was decommissioned because a larger powerhouse and a larger dam constructed upriver was under construction. In 1958, the Pacific Gas and Electric Company donated this powerhouse to the California State Park System. Visitors coming to Folsom Powerhouse have the ability 
to come in and see the original equipment, the generators, the pinstocks, the four bay, and see from the docents and learn from the docents how power, electricity, was generated through water. The Folsom Power House was celebrated by the City of Sacramento with an electrical carnival when it went online in 1895. It's historically significant for a number of reasons. Not only was it the greatest operative power plant on the North American continent, at least in the words of the mayor, it was the first to transmit electricity over a long distance, serving the City of Sacramento some 30 miles to the west. It also played a role in the dispute between Nikolai Tesla and Thomas Edison regarding their competition for alternating current or direct current, the two basic forms of electricity that could be generated by a hydro plant. Although Tesla's AC was selected for Folsom, it proved to be problematic, just as Edison had claimed, and difficult to keep synchronized in phase. For a time, two separate transmission lines had to be operated to deliver multi-phase power to Sacramento. Folsom Powerhouse State Park remains today as the best site to experience the world of the early hydro pioneers. The iconic powerhouse on the Pitt River, known as Pitt One, was in the planning for many years. We owe its endearing beauty to the architect Ivan Frickstadt. When it came online in 1923, Frickstadt had by then designed several powerhouses, and his experience showed. He stretched the academic eclectic style to its limits, with a fanciful design that was at once grand in scale and almost art deco in detail. He incorporated, for the first time, water as a design element in the powerhouse. The after bay, instead of discharging into the riverbed, flows into an elegantly sculptured tail race integrating water with stone as building material. Around the powerhouse itself, he designed a park with cottages, tennis courts, and a swimming pool. The Grand Lodge, with its redwood paneled lobby, overlooks the scene. Kathleen Forster, the owner of the lodge, explains its history. For many years, it housed the workers who were building the dams that continued down the Pitt River, and then continued to house the workers who um, worked to maintain and run the dams. It was a small community here. There were quite a few workers. There were at one point upwards of 40 small homes, including the lodge, people working here. There were families that stayed here. There was um, stores. There was a schoolhouse. There, the PG&E children were educated on this property and they played in this area. They played with the Pitt River Indian tribe children who also lived on this property. It was used as a retreat for PG&E workers. They could come up here and bring their families to stay. And that continued until 1995 when PG&E sold it. So it was owned continuously from the time it was built until 1995 and PG&E was um, wonderful stewards of this property. They kept it in a pristine order and what you see of this lodge, virtually 90, 95% of it is all original. Most of all of the interior is completely original and nothing has been done to it. It's rare to find a building of this historic age in this type of condition with all the original materials.
elegant turrets on the corners are functioning towers, complete with internal staircases that spiral to the top. Initially, Frickstat installed flagpoles on each turret, upon which American flags flew daily. Apparently that practice proved to be difficult to sustain, but the towers remained, complete with their internal staircases. Pit No. 1 Powerhouse is easily visited today. It is located directly on Highway 299, some 60 miles east of Reading. You know, a lot of good memories. It's 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 really a value to me to be a part of this powerhouse in this area. There's so much history, and the things that we are doing now are things that they did a hundred years ago. Same place, the same materials. Uh, we just have it a little bit easier, I think. So, what are we left with today as we contemplate the efforts of our pioneers? The industrial legacy continues as hydroelectric power comprises a significant portion of California's energy consumption. The network of water conveyances, so crucial to the success of early gold mining, continues to exist much as it did a hundred years ago. Sierra Foothill residents enjoy a unique asset, purchasing ditch water for pastures, vineyards, and even lawns. But perhaps the most significant legacy is a cultural heritage. The buildings so carefully designed by Frickstadt and constructed by diligent craftsmen are scattered throughout the Sierras in a chain of sites that invite the visitor to examine them one by one. Some of the most unique remains are non-physical. For instance, in this area of California, water is still measured, sold, and consumed by the miner's inch. Nowhere else has this archaic metric survived. And the man who operated the canals with a colorful title of ditch tender? He still exists, as this video of Steve Kettinger shows. Although Steve may ride to work in a pickup instead of a mule, and although he keeps his cell phone close at hand, and has a business card that describes him as a canal operator, he will be the first to tell you he's a ditch tender, just like his forebears. Finally, what about Lester Pelton? It turns out that 140 years of computer design and material science couldn't improve his design and he is one 49er who has not been forgotten by history. Whether you go to the depths of the Andes, the Alps, or the fjords of Norway, you will find electricity being generated by water wheels bearing the name of Lester Pelton.